Hello, Booktube. These are 10 novels I reread, some that I may still like. Uh, this video was inspired by a video that um, Shondi Stanfast uh, made last week and that Steve Donahue made a response video to. And I've seen a few other uh, responses as well. So I thought I'd add my own spin to it, which is that it's... I had a hard time coming up with uh, 10 novels that I've reread multiple times that I still like. Um, there are a few in this list of, in these 10 books, but most of them I've on a reread or two or three, I've become increasingly more critical of them and my enjoyment of the books have significantly lessened so yeah but so this is kind of going to be a bit of a uh, spicy video maybe so anyway let's get going so at number 10 is the last sun by katie edwards this is book one in the tarot sequence it's an urban fantasy uh Set on set in the city of New Atlantis, which is the island of Nantucket. It's about a young, impoverished aristocrat named Rune St. John and his uh, bound companion Brand, who are the last of the Sun Court, the aristocracy of New Atlantis or of the Atlanteans in this setting, are inspired by the tarot. And in order to make ends meet, Rune and Brand are occult detectives, mercenaries, and Rune and Brand are hired by the Tower to look for um, the Tower's missing godson. And this leads to a conspiracy uh, targeting a number of the arcana, the leading figures of um, the um, New Atlantis, which is the city state. But anyway, so I first read the novel shortly after it came out in 2018 and really liked it. Um, I loved the plotting and pacing, which is definitely Katie Edwards' strength, is this plotting and pacing. The world building is interesting, if not... Uh, I mean... It's inspired by the Arcana of the Tarot, which is cool, but lacking in, admin lacking in, in imagination. Um, so it, the world buildings, it's interesting, but it's mixed. And the characters, on my first reading, I liked them. I had some quibbles with some of the characterization, some of the backstories, but I liked it. Um, I reread the book in 2020 when the sequel, The Hanged Man, came out, and I basically turned against the book at that point. Um, it's the plotting and pacing is still good. Just it wasn't enough anymore to really plaster over my issues with the characters and also the fact that um, there one of the characters, Max, is basically at the beginning of the book, he's placed into Rune's custody. And on the first proper scene with Max, his head is being dunked into a toilet by Brand um, after a spat with Rune and Brand's housekeeper. I mean, it's a completely petty thing that was an easy fix. Just a simple conversation. But no, Brand had to dunk a 16-year-old boy's head into a toilet. And then Rune threw him into the uh, shower stall um, into the bathtub 
and he had just, he was taking a shower at the time. And it's later revealed that he was the victim of major abuse um, in his family. Um, and it's just that, that scene is just, it's so discordant, so, I, I don't understand it, I don't understand why it's never addressed, I don't understand why Max, mm. so it's basically, at that point, I started to really turn on the book, um, and the sequel really didn't improve things, it's a lot of Katie Edwards's mm, weaknesses as a writer kind of really sort of started to really come out in the second book. And, but I still w was curious to see how things progressed. So I was going to reread the series, hoping I kind of go back to liking it um, last year when the third book in the series, The Hourglass Throne, came out. And I could not get past that scene. Um, it just, no. So, yeah. So this is definitely, this is an example of me rereading a book and becoming more critical of it and not enjoying it at all on subsequent rereads, which is a shame because I really wanted to love this series and really hope that this series would be a success, but... Oh, well. N at number nine, I am I have um, Charming Billy by Alice McDermott. This is uh, a historical novel, I guess, um, about a man uh, reflecting on his relationship with his alcoholic cousin from the beginning of, or shortly before World War II, through to that cousin's death um, at the beginning of the novel. I read it in 2017 and loved it. Um, and if you've followed along with my channel for any length of time, you'll know I do not get on with whatever this genre is. Literary fiction, realistic fiction, upmarket fiction, whatever. I struggle with it. it. It usually does nothing for me. I usually bail pretty quickly, but this book worked really well. I loved it. It was one of the best books I read in 2017. So much so that I wanted to own a copy, so I picked it up in 2018 or 2019 and reread it in 2020, which was at the height of my turn away from fiction. And initially, I was actually going to bail. But I stopped myself, and I came back to the book and reread it. And I still like it, but I do have some criticisms. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much on my reread as I did the first time. Uh, largely because i noticing, well... How exactly the narrate? Because some of the book is narrated by the main character's daughter, and you have to question: Well, how does she know this? Like, how is she getting her information? It's like. But besides that, I still quite like the book. At number eight is *The City of Lost Fortunes* by Brian Camp. This is another. Um, Urban fantasy, this time set in New Orleans after uh, Hurricane Katrina. Jude is a demigod with a knack for finding lost items and people. But he's, but after Katrina, he's separated himself from the supernatural community of New Orleans until an old acquaintance tracks him down and invites him to a game of fortunes. Uh, form of poker with a number of uh, resident gods and a vampire um, who are playing for the fate of New Orleans. I read this book in 2018, shortly after it came out, and 
really loved it. There's one section towards the end that I'm not all that fond of, um, but I really love this book. And I've read the book um, three times. Yeah, because I read it, I reread it um, shortly after, like before the sequel came out in 2019. And really liked it. And then I reread both this and the sequel uh, last year, I think. It might have been 2021, but it was one of the two. And I still really like this book. I hate the sequel, though, but I really love this book. So this is one that I'm definitely, I don't know necessarily if it's risen in my estimation. I think my estimation is still pretty much the same. I largely like the book except for uh, a few bits here and there. At number seven is another work of fantasy, and I guess you can call it another urban fantasy. This is Priest of Bones by Peter McLean. This is the first book in the War for the Rose Throne tetralogy, I think, by now. So, basically, the novel set in Ellenburg, a fictional city in a fictional country in a fictional world. Uh, Thomas Piety is a gangster who is returning to the city after being off to war, and he's bringing his uh, company with him. And once they get to the city, he offers them a position within his organization, and they basically begin to retake his streets, which have, over the course of his absence, been taken over by other gangs. Uh, Thomas was at one point a member, uh, like a agent of the Queensman, a secret police organization uh, that re-recruit him in order to fight against um, foreign infiltration of the other gangs of, in the city. Um, so basically, Priest of Bones is a mix of, um, well, it's really, it's, Basically inspired by uh, Peaky Blinders, just with more uh, political intrigue, more spy thriller, particularly as the series goes on. Um, I love this book. It is amazing. I reread it twice, and or I haven't reread it twice. I've read it twice, and it's really good. I quite enjoy it. Um, and it didn't fall in my estimation the second time I read it. So. It's positive, although I hate the third book in the series. At number six. And number six is Dune by Frank Herbert. Um, so this is one of the great science fiction novels, one of the great space operas. It's the story of a galactic empire in which um, the House of Atreides is forced to give up its ancestral planet of Caladan for the desert planet of Arrakis, which is the source of the spice. A, an all-purpose drug that um, basically extends life, um, gives seeming superpowers to... Um, number of individuals, namely the navigators of the Spacing Guild, which use it to uh, basically give themselves precognizance so that they can navigate um, faster than light starships. The Atreides are opposed by the Harkonnens, um, and, who are supported by the Emperor. Uh, one day, um, the Harkonnens and the Emperor's um, forces the Sardaukar attack Dune to wipe out the Atreides. Paul and his mother are ex escape to the desert, rather taken them by the Fremen, and Paul then foments a rebellion against the Harkonnens and the Emperor. And fortunately for everybody involved, Paul is the end product of millennia of um, genetic engineering that basically sees him um, 
have a number of superhuman abilities, namely um, a higher order of or higher level of prescience than even the guild navigators. And yeah. So I I first read Dune in 2004, 2005, and I really loved it. Although, obviously from my description, I've never been all that fond of Paul. Um, and that's been true by subsequent rereads. I've reread Dune two or three times, I think. Um, and... Every time it's, I mean, I know Herbert is, he has a tight balancing act. On the one hand, Paul is the hero. That he, House Atreides, the Fremen, are depicted in, positively. Their, the descriptions, are, their descriptions are meant to create positive feelings for. We're supposed to root for them. But at the same time, with what's coming is that Paul's also the villain. He becomes the villain. Um, that once he's emperor, he is going to unleash the Fremen and billions of people are going to be murdered. And it's clear that's what's coming. And yeah, and no matter how bad the Harkonnens are, the Emperor is, they're not guilty of the murder of billions of people. Um, but of course, that's also a point. It's the other side of the, it is that the reader is meant to be cautious, to be wary of people like Paul, of the superhuman, of the Messiah, of the prophet, because those individuals can lead one to very dark places as it happens. But, I mean, except for maybe God Emperor of Dune, uh, which I've only read the once. It's I don't know necessarily if Herbert ever really successfully does the balancing act that he makes that would make Dune necessarily work for me. So yeah. So it's largely just like I really like that first reading, but subsequent readings I've had a lot a much harder time with Dune. <laughs> At number five is The Swimming Pool Library by Alan Hollinghurst. This is a contemporary, at the time it was published. It was a contemporary uh, gay English novel about a wealthy young man who really has nothing better to do with the time except for go to the club, um, both the uh, in the English sense of club, as well as the nightclub version of club, and to have sex. Um, he is out cruising one day when uh, another, an older gay man um, who is also cruising um, has a health issue. He has a health scare, and the main character saves him and they later meet and form a bit of a friendship and the older aristocratic gay man um, invites the younger man to write his biography and in doing so he begins to introduce uh, the younger gay man to the gay history of England and I I love the book the first time I read it except for the ending the ending is trash. Uh, but I really loved that first reading. And it was a, well over a decade after that first reading that I decided I wanted to come back to it and reread it again, as well as the rest of 
Hollinghurst's oeuvre. That this would have been in 2019. And I started the book and I put it aside. And I didn't think about it again until last year with the collapse of the No Fiction 2022. Um, and then I reread the book again and I really liked that second reading. It was fun. Again, the ending is a bit trash. But the rest of the book is really good. So this one is still positive, I would say. At number four is A Perdido Street Station by China Mievel. This is, I guess you could call it an urban fantasy too, since it takes place in New Crobuzon, although it is a fictional city in a fictional world. And it's more appropriately New Weird. Um, so Isaac is a rebel scientist who's trying to create a, a machine that produces infinite energy. He's sidetracked from this pursuit by the appearance of Yagorik, a Garuda, who asks Isaac to restore his flight. Um, Yagorik has, has, has had his wings amputated as a judicial punishment, and he wishes to fly again. So Isaac researches flight to figure out how to make Yagorik fly again. And he, part of his research is to collect things that fly, including moths. And so he has some larvae in his collection. And unfortunately, one of those larvae, well, when it pupates and becomes an adult, it's a monstrous moth that eats people's consciousnesses and then poops out nightmares. And there are a number of those moths in the city of New Crobuzon because apparently that poo can be used to make a drug. So that basically starts the plot. Um, I first read this in twenty in two thousand six and really loved. I loved it. Um, this was very inspirational for me. I. Basically, I wanted to write this kind of fantasy. Um, it was that inspirational. And I've come back to the book subsequently. Um, and I've enjoyed my rereading, my rereads of it. But it's been quite a while. Maybe not quite 10 years since the last time I read it. So I am overdue for a reread. So maybe if I have the time, I'll try to get to it sometime this year. Um, so at number three is A Radiance by Catherine and Valenti. This is for a change, not urban fantasy in any sort of a subgenre or other genre as well of fantasy. This is um, a space opera. It's a very weird space opera. It takes place in a um, solar system that is much different than ours. The planets are much closer, and all are habitable, including the moon. Um, it's about Hollywood. Um, Severin Unk is a documentary filmmaker who disappears while um, filming a documentary for a small village in Venus that was wiped off the map. Uh, and so the book is a look at what happened to her. Um, a meditation on Hollywood, and also on the grieving process, namely her father, who was a filmmaker, a director, who's trying to make a film in the only way he knows how, in the only genres he knows how, to kind of come to terms with her death. And so the book is a mishmash of these various prosifications of the movie script, that Percival Unk's making, um, interviews with Severin's uh, lover, and other uh, materials. And this is an amazing book. I first read it in 2017, and it was, I think it was my favorite book of 2017. And I've reread it uh, several times since, and 
except for my most recent rereading, reread last year or in 2021, um, I loved every reread. Uh, the last time I was kind of like grew a bit tired of it though, but yeah. So for number two, I'm going to have to go to my tablet because I do not have a standalone copy of it. I have this book in Omnibus, and that is A Pocket Full of Rye by Agatha Christie. And so I had to have an Agatha Christie on this list. And so I picked my personal favorite, which is A Pocket Full of Rye. I had thought about doing uh, two Christies, but I think I'll just go with one. So um, I'll go with A Pocket Full of Rye. So A Pocket Full of Rye is about the murder of Rex Fortescue a wealthy businessman, um, who, after his death, his um, coat is found to be uh, filled with, or his a pocket is found filled with a rye. Uh, subsequently, Rex's widow and housekeeper, or maid, are found murdered. The death of the maid brings in a uh, furious Miss Marple, who quickly wraps up the murder, uh, the investigation. She, it's. I love this book. Um, it just it speaks to me in a way. The characters are all interesting. The murder is interesting, and it's just it's a delightful read. Um, and I've re and I've read it several times. I think four or five, but the second time I read it in when I was in college, um, it wasn't necessarily a the most positive reading experience. I don't know why, but it was just, it was during that period where I really was kind of, well, I mean, by that point, I'd been well out of interest in detective fiction and Agatha Christie in general. Um, but then when I came back to Christie about not quite 10 years ago, I reread this novel about two or three times and loved it every time since. So. Yeah, I'm also sometimes a weird mood reader. Um, so finally, number one, and probably definitely the um, um, one that I'm probably, I yeah, unreservedly, this is the one that I still love um, every time I've reread it. And that is The Master of Go by Yasunari Kawabata. This is a fictionalized account of the retirement match of um, Honinbo Shusai and uh, Minoru Kitani. Honinbo Shusai is the one who's retiring. And it's basically, it's an epic go match that lasted half a year. Um, and every time I reread the book, um, I notice new things. Um, and this most, my most recent reread which I'll talk about during weekly reads because I read it yesterday. Um, it was amazing. I just, I noticed so much. Um, not only little details about the war, um, the match took place in 1938. So there's uh, some references to uh, Japan's uh, war with China during World War II. Um, but also hints that um, just how bad uh, Shusai's um, health problems were. Uh, like there, there are hints that his he he was having cognitive problems that I started to catch, and um, also some of his other health problems. So it was like it was a fascinating read. And every time I've read this book, I've really loved it. So yeah. So, had I made a top 10 rereads, if I actually was capable of making such a list, this still would have topped it, but it's topping this one, so. Anyway, whew, this video has gone on quite long enough, so I think I will hold off on making my 900 video Q&A announcement for tomorrow. Even, well, I guess I could go and do it today and while well, this is loading up. So I think I might go and do that. So in anyway, booktube, this was quite a bit of fun. Um, really enjoyed talking about these books. 
even if some of them I were tearing to shreds and probably should not reread them again. But anyway, so until I see you next time, thank you, have a great afternoon, and stay safe.